This week, the European Union has confirmed plans to try to counter Russian propaganda in the former Soviet Union and amongst Russian-speaking populations in Eastern Europe. Some would argue that the, the problem is actually closer to home and they should also be focusing on raising awareness and information campaigns within the EU itself to improve knowledge about Ukraine. One of the EU citizens who's been working hard to improve awareness of Ukraine within the EU is joining us here today in the Ukraine Today newsroom. Olivier Vedry, welcome. Well, I'm very happy to meet you. Really. Very happy to have you here. Olivier is a political analyst and a member of the Academic Council of the Assembly of European Regions. Now, Olivier, you'll be in Strasbourg next week, yeah. I understand, uh, presenting at a think tank about Ukraine. This is something you do on a regular basis. Uh, could you give us an indication of the kind of questions you get asked and the kind of key themes you'll be raising? I think the first is uh, really, uh, you know, this is uh, a work of pedagogy, you know. I have really to present the fact and only the fact. Because, uh, l you know, in, as you say, in Europe we have some propaganda, you know, very bad propaganda. And uh, my, my speech in this think tank in Strasbourg next week will be really to present the facts. What's happening in Ukraine? What is going on? And this is the title of my conference. What is going mm -hmm. on in Ukraine? Mm -hmm. Now, when, you, when you're, you're talking about Ukraine internationally, uh, what kind of issues are raised by your audiences? When you're talking to Europeans, when you're talking to academics and policy makers, uh, what are the key interests they have, but also what are the key misconceptions they have about Ukraine? You know, uh, at first I think they discovered Ukraine because um, the lot of persons, they, they, they now that they, 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 they really discovered Ukraine. Uh, so you mean now within the last year as a result yeah, of your Yeah, yeah, really. Idea. Because a lot of them, uh, they, they, they thought that Ukraine was a part of Russia and that, was, that it is very normal that Putin uh, uh, can say that Ukraine is also part of Russia. And that, that, that really, we have to, to present that Ukraine is really independent with another history, with other mentalities. And, uh, and this is one of the key issues, to present that Ukraine is a different country, independent country. Second issue is to, uh, s to present also that, uh, to, to, to fight against the, uh, the Russian propaganda. Because uh, in, 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 uh, in Europe, every everybody thinks that, oh, Putin is very strong, Russia is very strong, we cannot do a war for Ukraine. Well, they, they are very afraid. And when you know the reality, the, the economy in Russia, the situation in Russia, the, the Russian army, come on. We cannot be afraid. We are the first economy in the world. And with NATO, we have the first army. We cannot be afraid. But are they? But is it not a matter? Is it perhaps it's not an issue of them being afraid of losing, but they simply don't want to become involved. They don't see it as their problem. Now, how do you convince them that this is a European issue? You are right. Uh, I gave more than one inter interviews since Maiden, and when I want to convince, I say, remember, 1938, Munich. Don't be like that. Don't be like Daladier and Chabalin. Please, don't do Munich another time. Stop now. And really, if I want to commence, I say that. Don't be like in Munich in 1938. Because tomorrow, something can happen. If you do like that, Putin can take Ukraine take Baltic state, take Poland, we have to stop now. Now, you mentioned the, the parallels with 1938, the Sudetenland, the Munich conference. Uh, a lot of people made those comparisons at the time of the Crimean uh, mm. takeover last year and then have since continued to, to draw such parallels with Hitler in the 1930s. Uh, in the 1930s, at the time, Neville Chamberlain very famously said, and if, if I get the quote slightly wrong, I apologize, but it was something along the lines of, we don't want to get involved in a quarrel in a faraway land mm -hmm. amongst people we know nothing about. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea being that it was none of our business mm -hmm. to deal with these issues, that we should allow them to settle it themselves. Uh, 
I think it's fair to say that this is an attitude we see also in Europe today about Ukraine and Russia. How can they be convinced that European values are at stake here? That if European values aren't defended in Ukraine, then they will then be threatened within the EU itself, perhaps, where such values are taken for granted? Totally agree. This is really the, the, the key issue. Kiev is now the tone, the capital tone of Europe because of the values we are defending here. This is a war against two systems. If we lose this war, we will lose for all Europe. In Europe, some political party are more and more in favor of Putin way of thinking, less democracy, more authoritarianism. If we we'll lose here for Europe, that would be a shame and a bad future. That's why we have to win here because Kiev now is the capital of Europe because here we have the fight for Europe. Now you were on Maidan, I know. Um, yeah. You spent a lot of time with the, the activists who were involved in the protests. Mm -hmm. Do you feel disappointed in the, what's happened in, this, in, this, in the intervening year? Do you think enough has been done to live up to the, the goals that were set then and the ambitions for a re, you know, the reformism, the pro-European agenda? You know, uh, I, say, I said for, to some journalists with, during interview, we have to cut with the Soviet system in Ukraine. And that will take a long time. It's not be in one year. So it will take a long time. But. I am, I am optimistic because for me, Maidan is the beginning of a civil society in Ukraine. <laughs> this is the beginning of a civil society and now the people in Ukraine know they can do a pressure on the government. They know they have the power to do this pressure. And really, this is a big chance in the mentality of, the, of this Soviet heritage. We will not wait for our elite. We can do the job and force our elite to change. And this is really the heritage of Maidan. Freedom. Freedom and democracy. And that's why I'm optimistic, because now this is in the head, in the brain of the Ukrainian people. And I think in the history of Ukraine, you will have a before Maidan and an after Maidan. The reform, that will take time. But as I said, look, for Poland, how many times? More than 10 years. I think that will take 10 or 15 years here to change. But they are on the way. They are on the way. And you know, I am very optimistic because if, they, if, if, if Ukraine will be not on the way, Putin will not attack, you know? If Putin now is attacking Ukraine, this is because he knows that Ukraine is on the way to the EU and the European values. Well, it's been suggested that a successful Ukraine effectively will mean regime change or the same uh, mentality change in Russia itself. That if, if Russians see Ukraine becoming a more European society and integrating into Europe, Russians themselves will say, we want that too. Whereas in the past, they've always been encouraged to believe we're somehow different, we can't have that. So do you believe that this will be the case? If, if Ukraine is successful, it will lead to a, a, a sea change in Russia itself? Totally. Totally. That's why, you know, uh, I have family in Russia, I have family in Ukraine, I have family in France. And really, I did made down to share the European value and to, to all the European continent I believe also in this common space from Lisbon to Vladivostok, mm. but with EU values. That means democracy, human rights, dialogue, solidarity, equality, gender. This is very important. And I believe, I strongly believe that if we win in Kiev tomorrow, our values, we will win in Moscow. And Putin knows that. That's why he's very afraid about the, what's happened now. And you know, when, I, uh, when I, I, I gave some conference in Russia, because I was invited to do conference, they say to me that I am a decabrist. I say, <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, I am very proud to be decabrist and very happy because decabrist, well, Pushkin was decabrist, Tolstoy, Totoevsky. 
all the big Russian thinkers, they were in the way of Decabrist thinking. Then, for me, the wave <coughs> who began in Kiev will go to Moscow. I am sure of that. That would maybe take one year, two years, three years. But that's the sense of the history. Now, as a Frenchman, obviously in your country we have um, the rise of, of the Front National and, and uh, Marine Le Pen. Uh, there are similar parties who are gaining ground in a lot of European countries. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of individual uh, EU member uh, leaders uh, are looking uh, at their own uh, domestic uh, situation and, and perhaps not feeling so secure in themselves. Uh, in that sense, perhaps Ukraine's move towards Europe is very bad timing. It's come at a time when European leaders are preoccupied with their own domestic issues and with concerns that anti-EU EU parties are gaining ground. Do you think that's going to be a factor in terms of people's attitudes towards Ukraine? Do you see that in your interaction in Brussels and Strasbourg with the policy makers? For me, this is the same fight. And for me, Ukraine is a chance to fight even against those uh, extreme right party. We are fighting in France against the extreme right party for the EU values. We are fighting in Ukraine for the same EU values. And this is a global front. We have to win here to be an example for all Europe. And they will say, look, the Ukrainian, they die for EU values. And you, you are against EU values and they die for that? Ukraine is the only country in the world that the citizen can say we are dying to join EU and we are dying for the EU values. The only country in Europe is Ukraine and Ukraine can say that. This is the only country who can say that. This is a fact and we have to, we have to show that to all the extreme right party. Well, how do you get that message across? That's a very, very powerful message certainly but how do you get that across uh, to international audiences, the EU audiences, who are looking at the, the Ukraine crisis through the prism of geopolitics? And mm -hmm. they're seeing Russia, and they're seeing America, and, and Europe to a perhaps lesser extent. And this idea of Ukrainians choosing Europe is overlooked to an extent. I think people are saying, oh, well, America has these interests, Europe has such interests, Russia has such interests, and where's the Ukrainian interest? How do you get that message across to wider audiences? How? How? I use interview. <laughs> well. Interview conference. Um, like in Strasbourg. Uh, I try to do a uh, lot of interview, a lot of articles, a report, for example, the report I do for the Assembly of uh, the Region of Europe. Uh, I will present this report. I will do political recommendation. Uh, and uh, that's my. Like I say, my work, uh, but also that's what I believe. You know, uh, it's, it's very easy to me to fight because I believe in the value, uh, this value, the European value. It's very easy to me to fight for that because I strongly believe in that. Then I use all the tools I have, interview, uh, report, conference, uh, articles, to, to, to show that, to show that. And, um, <laughs> And this is really a fight because uh, I receive a lot of, you know, uh, protest. So, uh, and but who from? Who? who where does the objection? Extreme right come? party yeah. <laughs> in France, for example. Yeah. Uh, they really don't understand, and they 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 they, they, they take all the argument of the Putin propaganda, like say, uh, this is a complot. This is a complot of of US. This is a complot of EU. Yeah. This is really, this is nothing. This is like. Uh, it's nothing. Uh, nuts, you know. <laughs> well, this is the irony is that people here have complained that the Americans and Europeans have done too little. They've not done enough. And yeah. Yet, so the reality, US and EU, uh, I think they, uh, they are doing not enough. That's why, you know, I am for more sanction and for some uh, non-little uh, defense weapon for Ukraine because we have to more and more help Ukraine because this is a fight, I repeat, for all European continent and uh, for our values. 
In terms of the attitudes of the European Union itself towards, towards Russia and Ukraine, and we have now a, a sanctions policy in place, some people have said that actually the, the way forward is not to punish Russia but to help Ukraine, to put the emphasis more on giving Ukraine support, perhaps not lethal weapons or arms, but perhaps stronger uh, financial backing mm -hmm. and also a potential roadmap to membership, the perspective of membership. Um, former, the former Commissioner for Enlargement, um, Fuller, has been quoted this week saying that Ukraine should be given a perspective for membership. Uh, when you're, from your interaction with policymakers in Brussels, do you think that's possible or realistic? Would you support that? Uh, I, will, I will put that in my political recommendation in my report. We have to show the road. To give a motivation yeah, and incentive. Really, I, I will put that in my report in my political recommendation. Really, this is for me the key. Yeah. Do you think it's realistic? Yes, that's realistic. If we do a, a agenda step by step, this is realistic. But we don't have a choice of the choice. We have to do that. We have to do that. We have to do that to present uh, and to face, to present our forces and to face uh, the, the Russian uh, influence in Ukraine. But I will do this recommendation. Well, some people say that you know, punishing Russia indirectly hurts Ukraine because Ukraine has such close economic ties with Russia. So if Russia is struggling, it will effectively drag Ukraine down. So it's actually counterproductive to do so. Whereas if Ukraine is, is, is boosted, that will serve as a very strong signal to Russia that that is also in its interests. To, to I, I think we can boost uh, the Ukrainian economy and to continue the sanction against Russia. Uh, we can uh, help the Ukrainian economy to be focused on the EU market more and more. And uh, but as you know, the Russian market, uh, they stop a lot of uh, contract with uh, Ukraine companies. Yes. And it's very easy to took this company and to give them, um, can you say, uh, some invitation to work with uh, with the European Union, and uh, and really uh, that's uh, we have to continue the sanction. We have to continue the sanction. This is the only way uh, to um, to convince uh, Putin to to stop. Does he want to be convinced? Is he is, is he interested? Is he? You know. Uh, I think that you know a lot of analysts say that uh, Putin will dead in the Kremlin. Mm -hmm. This is also what I think. I think he will not uh, let the power go in. He will really die in the Kremlin. No, no peaceful transition yeah. with the Russians. No peaceful transition. So you're going to be in Strasbourg next week. Mm -hmm. You're going to be facing uh, a a. Um, varied reception I would imagine. I'm sure that the people there who are receptive to Ukraine and, and Ukraine's positions, I'm sure there'll be those who will be more, uh, maybe not hostile, but yeah. certainly, uh, <laughs> certainly more. Yes, more nuanced <laughs> in their approach. Yeah. Um, what's going to be your key message? Help Ukraine. Help Ukraine. Help Ukraine to go to the EU. And, uh, and if you help Ukraine, you help Europe. This is my message. Okay. Olivier, thank you very much for joining us. It was a pleasure to talk thank to you. you. Good luck in Strasbourg next week. <laughs>